Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Anton Warnchuk in Baltimore. Ukraine has signed a free trade agreement along with Georgia and Moldova that Ukrainian President Poroshenko and EU officials claim will give the nation access to markets of 28 other nations and lead to higher living standards. Meanwhile, a ceasefire between Ukrainian state security forces and pro-Russian separatists is due to end just hours from now. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees also has said that over 16,000 Ukrainians have been displaced from eastern Ukraine in the past week. Joining us now to give an update on the situation in Ukraine is Volodymyr Eshenko. Volodymyr is a sociologist studying social protests in Ukraine. He is Deputy Director of the Center for Society Research in Kiev, an editor of Commons Journal for Social Criticism, and a lecturer in the National University of Kiev Moila Academy. Thanks for joining us, Volodymyr. Hello. So uh, as we speak right now, the ceasefire between Kiev and the pro-Russian separatist rebellion in the east is due to end in a couple hours. Uh, so what, what has been the result thus far of the ceasefire? Uh, actually, it's, it's hard to call it a ceasefire because both sides claim that uh, the opposite side actually broke it. And uh, the Ukrainian side said that uh, the separatists uh, opened fire like 40 or 50 times during that week. And uh, the separatists uh, said that uh, there were some attempts from Ukrainian forces to attack as well. So the ceasefire was actually uh, kind of a fiction. And the, the biggest problem is that uh, the armed groups in uh, Bus are so actually decentralized and uh, kind of uh, not controlled from anyone. But it's uh, a big question how to actually impose a, a ceasefire which would be really working and not, 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 not just a fiction. Just 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 to, to, to tell one example, today there was an attempt to attack a military uh, zone uh, controlled by Ukrainian uh, soldiers by separatists armed with tanks. And that was uh, like the ended day of the ceasefire. But on the other hand, the, the uh, attempts, or at least uh, some very stark and informal negotiations to start the negotiations in the Kyiv government and uh, the uh, Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic are, were very promising. But the, the, the question is, would they develop real negotiations or would they be just another talks uh, in the middle of the war? So when the ceasefire officially comes to an end in the next couple hours, do you think that we're going to see a, sub, a subsiding of violence or do you think it's going to re-escalate? Um, I'm not sure it would... Uh, I would say that it, it's, it's going to continue as, as it is small attacks uh, by small groups and uh, not really coordinated with each other. I'm not sure there is a, like a plan for some great attack or storming each other positions. So one thing I wanted to ask you is that we, no, we don't normally see this or I don't see any, um, any reporting about this in the press here in the United States. Are there any other social protests of significance taking place right now in Ukraine that are not connected or affiliated with the pro-Russian separatist rebellions taking place in eastern Ukraine? Uh, there are many of such protests. The problem is that they, uh, they're not usually really big and really uh, kind of uh, taking the form of all national campaign. But the number of uh, local social protests are very high. It's, uh, usually high here. For example, in, in the last year, the majority of all the protest events, despite uh, the start in Maidan, were nevertheless about uh, social economic issues like wages, uh, taxes, environment, uh, privatization of public space in the cities. And th these were the, top, uh, the, the issues which were provoking the largest number of protest events during the last year. And even now, despite the war, there are, for example, labor protests in uh, uh, one of the most important and interesting uh, uh, just ended in Krivoyri, uh, which is a big industrial city in the central Ukraine, uh, the center of metallurgy. 
and where the miners uh, demanded increase of wages. And they were very quite clear that they are protesting not uh, for Kiev government and not against Kiev government and in the same time not uh, in support of separatists, but they did the protesting in uh, defense of their uh, uh, primary material interest. And uh, it's also interesting that most of the Kiev government and uh, the separatist uh, group are trying to mobilize the workers, but uh, without much success. As you probably recall, Akhmetov, the richest person in Ukraine, was trying to mobilize his uh, employees, and he has like 300,000 of them in Ukraine, to uh, protest uh, for united Ukraine and against the uh, separatist uh, groups. But he failed to do this. And at the same time, the separatist groups are trying to mobilize uh, workers, sometimes even forcefully, uh, to uh, support them. And, and the, the fact that they uh, usually have to use force actually says that they don't have really strong support about, uh, for, for them. But uh, generally, I would say that the workers in Ukraine are more or less paid. But it doesn't mean that they are ready to fight uh, against each other and ready to fight either for Kiev government or for separatist groups. Could you give us then a, a general sense of, of public opinion in terms of support for, uh, for Kiev and support for the separatists? Unfortunately, I didn't see this, uh, the polls uh, like this uh, since uh, the first half of May. And the, the, the polls which were done in, uh, in the first couple of May, and it means uh, after massacre in Odessa and after very brutal attack on Mariupol by Ukrainian uh, forces, they were showing that at least in Donbass there, there is uh, uh, some sort of uh, support for the claims of separatists and they, they, the people uh, in Donbass saw the uh, seizure of uh, governmental buildings as a people's rebellion, not as a terrorist act, not as a Russian intervention. But this is where the uh, public opinion in Donbass. In the rest of Ukraine, uh, the, many people actually seen what was happening in Donbass as precisely as Russian interve intervention. But uh, as I said, I didn't saw the, I didn't see the, the more recent uh, polls by any any company, and that's actually a, a problem. For example, the night uh, proper survey in the past in this situation. Okay, and then just for a final comment, uh, many critics have said that uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, which in full disclosure. Uh, has been funding your research into social protests in Ukraine. Uh, some critics say that uh, it was in, that the NED is instrumental in provoking some of the protests that were calling for uh, earlier this year that were calling for closer ties to the EU. Uh, what's your response? I would say that it's a uh, very, very common conspiracy theory about the role of foundations, but uh, usually the people actually do not understand how they work and how they actually are able to impose uh, their own agenda and uh, that's uh, that would be really over exaggerated to see uh, the institutions like NED uh, as uh, some provokers of uh, protests in, in Ukraine. They could support some, 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 some uh, NGO, they could support uh, uh, some initiatives but they uh, definitely didn't play any significant role in, uh, um, in like in like making the protest from the zero. That was uh, that was an internal phenomenon. That was a protest uh, driven by internal problems in Ukraine, and uh, uh, without the genuine support from people, it would be just impossible to have it, and it would be impossible to make it successful. 
as for our project, uh, that was a project in defense of peaceful assemblies and in the cooperation with the human rights campaign, which we, was protesting against uh, the uh, bill uh, um, which was pushed forward by Yanukovych government and requiring some restrictions on the procedure to organize uh, peaceful assemblies. And that campaign was quite successful, at least in the terms of uh, preventing this bill to be uh, imposed. And it, it would mean uh, quite uh, serious and uh, very detrimental restrictions to organize any kind of protest, including social economic protests, including labor protests. And what is really interesting that uh, in, the, uh, in the program announced by Yatsenyuk in the first days of the new government, he included this uh, bill on peaceful assemblies in his program. So that uh, it shows this kind of a continuity between the governments in Ukraine, despite their uh, animosity to each other, and despite some superficial uh, differences, they are using the same tools to control and to try to restrict uh, their uh, freedoms to organize and to protest and to defend uh, your own interests. Actually, the, as, as I recall, the laws which were passed by the parliament on January 16, and which actually provoked the turn to the violence by Maidan in the middle of January. And the, the, the problem with those laws were precisely the restrictions of civic liberties, so uh, freedom to organize uh, the protest, of freedom of speech, and so on. But now the uh, government are proposing and pushing forward uh, quite close restrictions. Uh, and of course, they justify it with the threat from, uh, from Russia, from the threat from separatists. And uh, all of the, the, it's. Uh, situation of the war, it's uh, moving the country, it, it, it's kind of like a military camp where the f civic liberties are uh, made more and more restricted. Okay, Volodymyr Shenko, thank you so much for that update from Ukraine. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.